Good day and welcome to today's webinar, The Clinical Utility of 1,25 Dihydroxy Vitamin D. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. Gregory Plotnikoff. Dr. Plotnikoff is a board certified internist and pediatrician who has received international honors for his work in cross-cultural and integrative medicine. Greg is a graduate of Carleton College, Harvard Divinity School, and the University of Minnesota Medical School. From 2002 to 2008, Dr. Plotnikoff served as an associate professor at Cale University School of Medicine, where he studied, researched, and taught the Campbell herbal medicine tradition. In Japan, he was active in East-West medical integration issues with the Japanese Society of Oriental Medicine, National Geographic, and the World Health Organization. He is the recipient of several international awards for research and teaching, as well as the Early Career Distinguished Achievement Award from the University of Minnesota Medical School. Dr. Plotnikoff is well known for his work in interventional nutrition, herbal medicines, and spirituality and clinical care. He has additional training as a hospital chaplain in medical acupuncture and mind-body skills and as a practitioner of traditional East Asian medicine. He is co-author of the book, Trust Your Gut, and author of 22 textbook chapters and more than 50 first author articles in the medical literature, including several in Japanese. In 2003, his 2003 article on vitamin D and chronic pain is one of the most highly cited articles in the history of the Mayo Clinic proceedings. Dr. Plotnikoff serves an, as an integrative medicine physician at the Penny George Institute for Health and Healing and as a senior consultant at the Center for Healthcare Innovation, Alina Healthcare in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He also serves as a co-editor of the new journal Global Advances in Health and Medicine. Dr. Plotnikoff will be taking questions. To type a question, simply click on the green question and answer button in the lower left corner of your screen. You can do this at any time during the webinar and Dr. Plotnikoff will read and respond, them, respond to them at the end of the presentation. So at this time, I will turn the webinar over to Dr. Plotnikoff. Great. Well, thank you, Alice, and thank you all for uh, joining me this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. The topic is the clinical utility of the dihydroxy vitamin D, the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. And this has turned out to be something that's really actually quite hot, and so I'm very interested in sharing with you um, the practical implications of this. But first, let me uh, start and, and give a disclosure. Um, no off-label use, no investigational use, and that I am receiving an honorarium for doing this. In addition, I want to note in the nine case studies that I'll present, each has been drawn from the peer-reviewed medical literature and has already gone through IRB approval. And so therefore, I will not be um, violating any of my patients' uh, uh, privacy and presenting um, uh, their particular stories without IRP approval. So let's go ahead and get started. First of all, the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, you think about, wait a second, is this about something about as rare as a polar bear in London? Um, well, in fact, actually, um, this has actually turned out to be a very important aspect of um, advanced uh, medical practice. And in my particular uh, practice, uh, for example, I only accept a physician referrals for the most complex uh, patients, uh, mystery illness. And therefore, having this tool and this understanding has been crucial in, um, in both diagnosis and treatment of a number of patients that I work with. But when it comes to vitamin D related issues, uh, you may be like most people who just kind of throw up their hands and say, oh my God, this is so complex. And in fact, actually um, one could get lost in uh, vocabulary and a variety of things. So my aim today is to make, is to bring some calm and, and have a logical flow um, so that you can feel comfortable in understanding uh, vitamin D testing 
and uh, and its applications, and particularly uh, the use of the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D um, and its relationship to testing for 25 hydroxy of vitamin D. In doing so, I'm going to want to address um, these uh, clinical areas. Hypercalcemia, um, which by far and away is most important. We will also address hypocalcemia and the use of the 125 um, in normal calcemia. In addition, we will address the issue about monitoring uh, treatment and therapies uh, with use of uh, this uh, testing. So let's go ahead and begin and uh, with, oops, failed to connect to server, please click the refresh button below. Okay, so a little technical glitch and we should be okay. And here we go. All right, so some key points that, uh, that everyone needs to know. One is that the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D is the activated form. It is the hormone um, and that binds to the vitamin D receptor found in numerous tissues throughout the body. However, the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D test is not the measure of vitamin D status. And this is very important. Sometimes people accidentally order this test when they really should be ordering the 25 hydroxy vitamin D test. Part of the reasons for this is that the half-life of this hormone is about four to six hours, and its concentration is just um, is a thousand times less than that of the 25-hydroxy vitamin D. This also points out the fact that getting good, accurate measurements has been a technical uh, challenge. And so the recent breakthroughs and now the availability of FDA-approved uh, testing uh, represents a remarkable new era in uh, vitamin D. So let's review. On the left side of the screen is something taken from the Netter series. And so this is something that people like myself who are in med school in the 1980s uh, would have learned. And that is, you know, if we follow things here, we've got, you know, uh, sunlight um, um, activating the 70 hydro cholesterol found in our skin. That um, in the presence of heat, then it becomes vitamin D3, the cholecalciferol. Um, the same thing found in the supermarket shelves. Um, it can um, then go on to liver becoming um, the 25 dihydroxy vitamin D, um, and then going on to kidney, where in the proximal tubule, the 125 dihydroxy vitamin uh, D uh, would be produced. And that still is true. The nuances uh, since then include um, issues about having the vitamin D receptor and where it is found and its activity and its polymorphisms. The use of the SIP um, P450 system and the roles that it plays in activating and deactivating um, vitamin D. And then additional information uh, that uh, future uh, is going to involve also understanding what exactly is the role of vitamin D binding protein. We won't be addressing that today, um, but I do want to kind of bring you up to date where, where things are. So this slide here kind of is a nice way of bringing it all together. So upper left hand corner, the 7 dehydrocholesterol found in the skin in the presence of ultraviolet B, that is approximately 300 nanometer wavelength, um, you can get a pre-vitamin D that in the presence of heat will isomerize and become what we know as vitamin D3. This is um, known as um, cholecalciferol, which is vitamin D or vitamin D3 available over the counter um, widely um, and what would be found in supplemented uh, milk, uh, etc. Um, or ergocalciferol, which is actually um, derived from mushrooms. Ergosterol in the cell wall of fungi when exposed to ultraviolet B goes from uh, ergosterol to ergocalciferol, vitamin D2, 
which has a shorter half-life than D3 and has different metabolic products, and so there are nuances in the use of ergocalciferol and cholecalciferol. The important point here is, and the next step is, um, is the, the CYP2R1 uh, um, found in the liver. We get the production of calcidiol circulating and then going through CYP27B1, it becomes activated vitamin D calcitriol. Now the CYP27B1 is also known as the 1-alpha hydroxylase and that is found in great concentrations in the proximal tubule of the kidneys. However, it's been found also to be, it's been demonstrated uh, throughout the body, including parathyroid um, and immune cells, um, muscle cells, uh, and uh, widely distributed. And because the calcitriol is actually a hormone, it binds the superfamily of nuclear receptors of which the vitamin D receptor is one. And that has great uh, implications um, uh, for health, and we'll, talk, we'll continue talking about that. So here's a, a clinical pearl. Low vitamin D, that is the 25-hydroxy vitamin D that can be measured, means uh, low ionized calcium. Um, low ionized calcium means increased PTH. Increased PTH means increased 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. And so therefore, you have this very interesting pattern. 25-hydroxy vitamin D deficiency at times can equal a 125-dihydroxy elevation. Likewise, in um, vitamin, over-the-counter vitamin D toxicity, that is ex uh, when one has exceptionally high levels of the 25-hydroxy vitamin D, one could actually have profoundly low levels of the 125. So there really is no correlation whatsoever between the two. Um, that is, you can't plot out a linear relationship. It's all over the map. The one thing we do know is that the 125 does increase during pregnancy and the actual significance of that is not fully understood. Next, let's go ahead and take a look at the whole circle here. Key point is this is what has been, been measured um, and uh, by classic vitamin D. We talked about the CYP27B1 being activating it and getting the 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. Please note that parathyroid hormone um, will actually feed back and regulate uh, the CYP27B1, the 1-alpha-hydroxylase. It also feed back and address this issue of CYP24A1, which is the breakdown enzyme. And so parathyroid, uh, this is a feedback loop um, between uh, these. Additionally, um, we will address the issue about the fibro fibro fibroblast growth uh, factor 23, FGF 23, uh, which has another feedback loop. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. But just uh, the key point here to remember, a simple point is, 125-dihydroxy vitamin D production is tightly regulated. And so it's under very close control. Key point, um, please keep that in mind as we talk about cases. So as clinicians, here's what people need to understand. Uh, and this is what exactly I would be teaching in the medical school of this class. Inpatient hypercalcemia is almost always due to malignancy. Um, and so the differential diagnosis for an inpatient uh, with high calcium levels uh, could include um, bone breakdown due to metastatic cancer or, or multiple myeloma, elevated parathyroid hormone, which would be due to primary hyperparathyroidism, or ectopic production of parath uh, parathyroid hormone, uh, most often would be associated with malignancies, but there are other conditions as well. You can have production of a parathyroid hormone-related protein um, that is malignancy-related. Um, you can have excessive supplementation of vitamin D, and that can include unintentional through uh, tube feedings or, um, 
or uh, other uh, uh, unintentional uh, problems. Um, or you can have actual excessive 125-dihydroxyvitamin D production. And um, for outpatient hypercalcemia, here are the things that are always happy to be concerned. Number one, primary hyperparathyroidism. Number two, vitamin D intoxication uh, through excessive uh, intake. And then um, number three, granulomatous diseases uh, such as sarcoid or histo. In fact, um, there are literally dozens of granulomatous diseases that can be related to um, high uh, hypercalcemia. Malignancy, of course, an outpatient issue. Um, acromegaly or excessive growth hormone. And then there are actually about 30 different conditions which are associated with um, uh, uh, hypercalcemia, and so it can include uh, different inflammatory conditions, infectious conditions, um, and as we'll see, um, even uh, polymorphism, polymorphisms in uh, CYP enzymes. So, and I have here saying, last section didn't succeed, please try again. Um, let's try again here. First case. Okay. Our first case is a 67-year-old previously healthy male, in fact, as healthy as can be, um, developed polyuria, unsteady gait, dizziness, confusion, dehydration, brought to the emergency room. Uh, he's found to be acute renal failure, a creatinine of 4.9. Um, his calcium is sky high at 16.3. Okay. Here we think about what is our differential diagnosis. We need to think, you know, primarily, let's take a look at number one, parathyroid hormone. It comes back high. Okay, well, we have a good explanation for this. Um, let's resuscitate him and let's get an ultrasound of his parathyroid and lo and behold, there is a mass. So a treatment, of course, in this case, after resuscitation is surgery, it needs to have the mass removed. And uh, lo and behold, his parathyroid hormone goes down as it's removed, and his, his renal failure resolves, his PTH is normal, and we've got successful resolution of a commonly seen condition, primary hyperparathyroidism. Now, nuance. Wait a second, his calcium is still high, 11.1. .1. What now? Well, that's when we go back to our differential, differential diagnosis and consider, okay, is it primary hyperparathyroidism? No, it's been treated. Is it vitamin D intoxication? Well, let's get a 25 hydroxy vitamin D level. Is it perineoplastic or is it due to um, other conditions? Um, and let's get a 125 dihydroxy vitamin D as well. The results are that uh, his parathyroid hormone related protein is normal and his dihydroxy vitamin D is sky high at greater than 200. Well, what now? So let's go back to our differential diagnosis. Is it sarcoid or other granulomatous disease? Is it malignancy? Is it acromegaly? Is it some other condition such as inflammatory or infectious? Well, uh, common things being common in previously healthy in people it's more likely to be uh, sarcoid granulomatous or, or some kind of inflammatory condition. So um, go hunting for this and um, click to the next slide here. So there's no evidence of any granulomatous disease on exam, um, no suggestion of any bone mets, no suggestion of uh, really being, having growth hormone issues. So looking for malignancy, we'll do things such as uh, PET scanning or CTs or elsewhere. Um, and lo and behold, he's found to have a large B-cell lymphoma in his spleen. And actually looking for, you know, with immunoreactive agents, you can actually demonstrate that he's got the one alpha hydroxylase um, present in uh, this lymphoma. And so therefore you have extra renal uh, and uh, unphysiologic or, or um, outside of normal parameters production of the dihydroxy vitamin D. And so hence uh, having this uh, test is actually very, very helpful in uh, defining um, 
uh, cases. So let's uh, move on to a second case. Here's a 65-year-old male, okay, and he is found to be vitamin D deficient. How many people have seen this? This is, this is common worldwide now as more and more people are being tested and found to be deficient. Deficiency is certainly a worldwide issue, easy enough to treat. And he's actually given a prescription dose for ergocalciferol, 50,000 international units uh, um, uh, once or twice a week uh, for several months. Um, repeat uh, uh, testing became important as he became symptomatic. Again, issues like headache, fatigue, nausea, diarrhea, polyuria, um, and um, with becoming symptomatic, he checked his calcium, and lo and behold, 14.1, quite high. Is this a case of iatrogenic uh, vitamin D toxicity? How can we tell? Well, that's what we really becomes important. So obviously we're gonna stop any kind of supplemental vitamin D and um, go through our differential diagnosis. Is it primary hyperparathyroidism? Is it vitamin D intoxication, granulomatous, malignancy, acromegaly, or the others? So, and that's where you really have to know about the sequencing of ordering. Parathyroid hormone, the 25-hydroxy-D, and then most often people maybe get together um, looking for perineoplastic or granulomatous, depending on clinical situation, whether you want to get the 125 alone or when you get it with the PTH-related protein. In this case, uh, we'll follow that order. His PTH comes back normal. So his high calcium is not due to the primary hyperparathyroidism. His vitamin D comes back normal. So in fact, his prescription vitamin D was, is not a cause of this. This is not an iatrogenic issue. It's an issue that became actually um, uh, unblinded or actually appeared because of this treatment. Um, his related protein is normal. Okay, it rules out some type of malignancy and his 125 dihydroxy is elevated. Okay, all right. Crucial for solving this case is this lab value. So we have to go hunting. Why is it? Is it granulomatous, malignancy, or elsewhere? Chest X-ray, CT is negative. A common lab test for sarcoid called angiotensin converting enzyme, um, ACE um, is suggestive and not definitive, and uh, ACE is, uh, levels um, correlate but are not, uh, are not definitive. Uh, in many cases, you can have normal levels with uh, sarcoid. So we don't have a full picture here. It's a little bit ambiguous. What is the next step? So in this case, whether it's granulomatous or whether it's kind of inflammatory uh, treatment is very reasonable to go ahead and treat with prednisone, and they did. And, um, and lo and behold, is 125 normalized. And so they continued for a while, stopped, and then it come, the hypercalcemia comes back. Okay, that's when you have to begin then a further um, evaluation. The intense uh, splenic uptake is found. Is this another lymphoma? Well, it's kind of uh, the treatment, in either, whether or not it's treatment splenectomy, and um, actually is found to have sarcoid in the spleen. And so in either, you know, as in the first case, you have a lymphoma limited to the spleen. Second case, you have a sarcoid limit to the spleen. And it shows that, um, that uh, clinical um, evaluation becomes really, really, really important. And laboratory testing is so important because things can be um, hidden and unexpected. So let's uh, go on to the next case then. I'm clicking here, and a third common situation um, is that of chronic kidney disease. And uh, I became very sensitized to this back in, in med school in the 1980s when I was um, working in pediatric nephrology and where renal osteodystrophy had, uh, in the days really before, we had a lot of uh, pediatric kidney transplants for uh, chronic kidney disease. 
These children, growing, developing children, developed in renal osteodystrophy and became greatly uh, distorted in, uh, in bones, height, and um, it was an incredible um, uh, change that, uh, that completely destroyed not only appearance, but destroyed their ability to fully uh, function and participate in life. Major, major, major issue. Um, and um, we can talk about that uh, in a little bit more. In this particular case, where it's not a child at all, it's an 81-year-old. And this is probably much more frequently seen in people's practice. That is um, someone with um, diabetic nephropathy who's on dialysis. And uh, with uh, dialysis, it was discovery that, um, that the vitamin D receptor is found in the parathyroid hormone or parathyroid um, gland itself, meant that the activated vitamin D uh, regulated parathyroid hormone. And this is where the renal osteodystrophy issue uh, became important, where people could then um, treat with either activated vitamin D or vitamin D analogs um, or uh, pro-drugs uh, such as alpha-calcidiol and actually uh, prevent uh, renal osteodystrophy issues or, or, or bone, significant bone losses. This has been a big breakthrough because it's also significantly um, reduced mortality, um, uh, this treatment, and so uh, there's, there's great uh, value in it. And of course, it needs to be monitored. In this 81-year-old, he was having progressive hypercalcemia. So he stopped, the, of course, the treatment with the analog and it progressed. And he develops fatigue, anorexia, insomnia. Hmm, what's going on? He's got examination is normal. Routine labs are normal. So let's go through our differential diagnosis. Is it primary hyperparathyroidism? Is he have excessive vitamin D intake or excessive calcium intake? Or does he have increased 125 dihydroxy D? So we go through the, uh, the labs, PTH is normal, and it's kind of got a low normal, 25 hydroxy, and kind of classic uh, people with renal disease. His related protein is less than one, so it doesn't, and his 125 is at the upper edge of normal at 55. Hmm. Well, what do we do now? And it doesn't fit what we're talking about. Um, or, well, his chest x-ray is normal, um, his ACE is borderline, again, it's kind of not really helpful. Um, so the next step, well, and this raises an important point, um, the laboratory results for calcium, you have clear hypercalcemia. Um, and the results of the 125 dihydroxy D are important here. In patients with chronic kidney disease, you do not expect to have elevated levels or even high normal levels of 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. The kidney is just not there. Uh, the uh, proximal uh, interstitial tubules are just not going to be producing um, the 125. And so you can even have a quote normal level um, and, um, and, and that would be considered relatively high. And so therefore, um, based on this, and we still have to go through then the differential diagnosis. Is it sarcoid? Is it other granulomatous disease? Is it lymphoma or other malignancies? Is it growth hormones excess or other things such as um, uh, in, in different inflammatory diseases or um, a rare infectious diseases? So you can tell why getting a good and, and valid and accurate measurement of the 125 is so important in these patients with chronic kidney disease. It's, it's crucial because the next steps are quite invasive um, you know, or, or very expensive. Or, um, so whole body CT, PET scanning, skin biopsies, bone marrow biopsies, um, all invasive, all expensive, and want to be um, uh, very sure that, that these next steps are absolutely indicated. So in this case, um, we're able to go to skin biopsy. 
and it showed non-caseating granulomas with multinucleated giant cells, classic for sarcoid. So a treatment, do we give prednisone or not? So obviously before giving prednisone as a potent uh, steroid, uh, and if you're gonna be treating uh, sarcoid, um, you treat uh, with fairly high doses for long periods of time. So it's a very important decision. You have to be very clear on, on next steps uh, for this. And, um, and so in this case, they said, well, a lot of sarcoid kind of resolves on its own. The hypercalcemia wasn't so excessive. Um, we were closely monitoring him since he's getting dialysis three times a week. So let's monitor symptoms. Let's monitor a physical exam. Let's monitor his calcium. Let's use the vitamin D3 cautiously and we'll monitor his 125. These last two points are really crucial. Sarcoid is a fairly common disease and uh, vitamin D status is very important. We do not want um, people to um, have low vitamin D levels as a 25 hydroxy D um, because of a couple reasons. Number one, um, is that uh, low levels um, mean that there's going to be low 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, and therefore all the hormonal issues related to the vitamin D receptor activation and gene regulation in multiple tissues throughout the body becomes very important. Second, uh, it appears that uh, in many conditions that uh, vitamin D um, uh, plays a significant role um, in uh, modulating immune response and the like. And so, so there's uh, biological plausibility even if there aren't randomized controlled trials. And um, third is that when giving people uh, with a sarcoid vitamin D, you wanna make sure that you're not actually kind of creating a, a situation of excessive 125. And so for all those people on, with sarcoid who, or a history of sarcoid who are receiving vitamin D, you need to, uh, monitoring is very important uh, of the vitamin D level and the dihydroxy vitamin D um, so that we can avoid uh, hypercalcemic uh, situations. Hypercalcemia is not only an unpleasant um, physiological experience uh, for people with nausea and diarrhea and uh, headache and fatigue, uh, but with uh, advanced levels and uh, mental status changes, uh, profound uh, dehydration, uh, and certainly it can be quite life-threatening. So, and with doing this, these uh, physicians were able to avoid using prednisone in this patient, and, but 16 months later, it became clear that he really needed it. And that's where that monitoring the 125 really became uh, very important. Okay. Another case, 50-year-old female, hypercalcemia, not so bad, 10.9. She's got a normal 25-hydroxy-D. Her PTH is low. She's got no related protein, and her 125 is sky high. Okay, what might be going on here? Well, in fact, um, going through things, you know, being able to rule out um, most frequently seen uh, problems are like granulomatous disease, um, ruled out malignancy. Um, then what else do you need to consider? Well, in fact, actually, um, parathyroid hormone 125 and um, issues around growth hormone um, are all interconnected with insulin-like growth factor one. So it is now becoming apparent that um, since we can also measure these, that we can actually then go and further define um, conditions of hypercalcemia that haven't been well understood before. And in this case, she had very high insulin-like growth factor, uh, one, very high growth hormone. So we have to go hunting for pituitary tumor, and lo and behold, she has one uh, by MRI. Now, the treatment of uh, uh, choice here, of course, is surgical resection and uh, the transphenoidal um, route, um, which um, is, have, presents its own technical challenges, but it is quite doable. The tumor is not excessively large, and so it's accessible. 
and, and surgeon reports a complete reception. So postoperatively, we can measure these things to see, well, how well is this really true? Calcium is normal, IGF-1 is normal, growth hormone is normal, and the dihydroxy is normal. We have a cure. Okay, this is great. So, celebration. Let's do a, a similar case. Another uh, woman, uh, 52, she's got uh, mild hypercalcemia, she's got low PTH, normal 25-OH, relayed protein is normal. And her dihydroxy is high normal at 66, but her physical exam has visual field cuts, and that is kind of loss of capacity to see um, areas, and that is classic for uh, a pituitary uh, tumor impeding or kind of encroaching upon uh, uh, nerves, uh, optic nerves. So we do need to get an MRI on her and um, or we need to consider uh, uh, this. And so in fact, actually the MRI was done first. Uh, she had a three centimeter, fairly large, invasive pituitary uh, macro adenoma and with related um, uh, marked elevations and uh, growth factor and uh, insulin-like growth factor and growth hormone. So this combination, um, you see where it's all connected. Now, reception of something this large is quite complicated because of location. And so we need to monitor, of course, uh, uh, postoperatively. So postoperatively, your calcium is still high and it's, and it's bouncing between 10-1 and 11-1. Her insulin-like growth factor is still high, uh, quite high at 440. Her growth hormone has come down, but is still high uh, from, at 12.8. And her dihydroxy has gone from 66, uh, upper limit of normal, to actually a high at uh, 81. This is not a cure, and this is someone who needs um, close monitoring. So how are we going to monitor? Well, certainly the 125 dihydroxy is going to be important to a factor because of um, excessive uh, calcium and, and excessive uh, 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 production of uh, activation of all the vitamin D receptors. So at this point, then, it becomes uh, important to say, well, okay, then what else can we do? And, uh, and that is where um, uh, the future of uh, treatments uh, will uh, be taking place, that there are a variety of interventions to try to suppress things at this time. Okay, so and it's confirmed that this patient had residue and therefore needs monitoring. Okay, what is another common situation? Okay, now uh, we're, we're going to be um, um, uh, talking about kind of kidney stones here. And again, worldwide, it's a huge, 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 huge uh, uh, incidence. And most often, it's uh, things related to calcium oxalate, and current treatments include uh, use of vitamin B6, um, uh, low oxalate diets, um, and people, um, uh, vitamin C. Very interesting research going on about use of probiotics. Um, um, we're going to go in a different direction here. So this is kind of an interesting case because this is a young person, 24-year-old guy who has had six years of frequent kidney stones. It's very clear that he's got hypercalciuria, so he's got lots of calcium being released into his urine, and he also has hypercalcemia. Hmm. But his PTH is low. His vitamin D is normal and his dihydroxy is high. Hmm. Well, here's where we need to go through that differential diagnosis again. And so is it granulomatous? Is it malignancy? Is it acromegaly? Is it something else, uh, inflammatory or infectious, or very kind of more rare uh, conditions? Well, in fact, actually, um, extensive evaluation showed that he actually had reduced function of his CYP24A1 enzyme and at late onset. And so this is uh, very interesting. So let me return then to remind you where the CYP enzymes uh, go. 
So we've been talking about CYP27B1 as the activating enzyme to take um, the 25-hydroxy vitamin D to the activated vitamin D, the 125. And, but also important is the breakdown of these uh, as part of the whole regulatory system. That's the CYP24A1 is involved in breakdown. So we, as we discover more and more polymorphisms, polymorphisms um, um, for CYP enzymes, we discover that if one has a profoundly low functioning CYP24A1, then chances are we can have um, high levels. It's biologically plausible. And so that would be the story in this case. Now people are looking at um, CYP24A1 inhibitors um, or activators um, to help uh, uh, with these polymorphisms. And it's a very exciting area of future research um, applicable to many uh, things, not just kidney stones, but also uh, cancer, uh, et cetera. Okay. All right, we've done six cases so far, um, and I'm glad people are sending in questions. I look forward, I'm hoping this is provocative, and I'm hoping that you're understanding the, the clinical reasoning and the uh, utility. Um, we've been talking about hypercalcemia, um, and, um, and so let's take a look and consider um, other cases. The hypercalcemia so far has been in non um, malignancy cases. Uh, so let's talk about malignancy. This is a 57-year-old guy with left flank pain, anorexia, 23 kilos of weight loss over two months. He's sick. CAT scanning um, over the area of pain shows that he's got a large mass in his left kidney and he's got retroperitoneal lymph nodes. Uh, this is some kind of malignancy. Biopsy done shows that he's got a renal cell carcinoma. This is a bad diagnosis. So we're going to do everything we can. Uh, best uh, hope is surgical resection. But preoperative evaluation finds him to be nauseous. He's attributing that to morphine. He's got low sodium. He's got um, high glucose. And he's hypercalcemic with a relatively normal albumin. So. Nausea could certainly be due to the hypercalcemia. Why is he hypercalcemic? And if he is hypercalcemic going into surgery, um, how significant uh, might this be? It can certainly uh, uh, cause uh, intraoperative problems. So in fact, um, let's go through, again, our differential diagnosis. What are the labs we're going to get? Well, first the PTH, second the 25-OH, then the relayed protein, we can consider bone scans about metastases or other issues, and we get a 125 uh, level. And so going through these, the PTH is low, 25-OH is normal, the related protein is normal, and his 125 is quite high. Hmm. Going into surgery, this is, a, this is important to know. We need to find out what might be going on here, or at least we're going to need to um, um, preoperatively kind of counterbalance so that uh, calcium uh, uh, excess is not going to um, be a problem during surgery. So um, able to get his calcium down to 10.6, okay, so not uh, excessively high, um, and um, he, so he undergoes surgery, uh, corrective surgery, um, actually a kind of extensive surgery, and Postoperatively, his 125 comes down to 24 from 118, and his calcium comes down to normal. So actually, surgery was the treatment of choice for this hypercalcemia. And so looking at the pathology, he actually had a very unusual tumor, this uh, divergent differentiation between squamous and sarcomatoid uh, appearance of uh, the renal cell carcinoma. And if one looks in the literature, one can find many cases actually of hypercalcemia, suppressed PTH, and normal parathyroid hormone-related protein. But, no, but because 125 testing has not uh, been readily or easily available, case studies are not reporting on this. And so in fact, having this 
uh, new measurement allows us to advance knowledge uh, of malignancies. And so this is a, a area uh, of uh, potential um, great interest in the future to help us better understand um, uh, malignancy and um, an optimal treatment. Okay, so hypercalcemia, we've done seven cases. Um, I did talk about that. We were talking about hypocalcemia and normal calcemia for the 125. And so um, our next case is something you say, um, oh yes, rickets. This is a, a very important issue these days as actually worldwide the incidence of rickets has become really um, quite uh, increased. Uh, a recent um, headline in the London newspaper talked about a significant and um, remarkable increase in rickets in the UK uh, in children. And so it's something we must all be aware of and must, uh, uh, and must help get the word out on. And uh, this case actually comes um, from a country where rickets, um, where massive increase in rickets led to national public health uh, campaigns to ensure that all infants got vitamin D supplementation. And uh, this case actually comes out of the supplementation uh, um, public health uh, movement. And that is there's a 25 month old female. She's got disproportionate growth. She's perspiring, she's constipated, she has deformed extremities, she has walking difficulties. Um, she's got hair loss, um, you know, called partial alopecia, so patchy. And she's had convulsions that no one can explain. She's got bone pain, she's got weak muscles. Okay, clearly it's a child who is quite ill. So is it rickets? Well, um, why, we don't know. What else might we find on exam? So um, she's got an open anterior fontanelle, the, the soft spot in the front of the head. Her sutures are normal. She's got mild frontal bossing, so that's a, a dysmorphic feature, uh, um, the patchy distribution. And she's got some very interesting things. So at her wrist, um, she's got what are called double joints. That's kind of, it's, it's wide and there's kind of two bumps right here, or like to bear. so double joints, um, clear changes um, in both the radius and ulna, the two uh, bones of the forearm that go to the wrist. He's got a, a widened um, distal metathesis of the fibula. Now what this is, the fibula is one of the um, bones of the lower um, portion of the leg that goes into the ankle. Now we all recognize that there's kind of an ankle bump um, um, on both sides of the ankle. This would be an additional um, bump. So instead of one um, kind of ankle bumps, there are two, uh, clearly uh, an abnormal situation. And then she's got the classic um, bowing of the legs, the, the X sign. Um, and uh, so it looks like rickets, 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 rickets until proven otherwise. So. Um, but vitamin D is normal. Now rickets is a vitamin D deficiency level. So we've got some other kind of situation here. What's going on? You know, is it a calcium problem? So let's get calcium and oh, lo and behold, it comes back low. So this is a case then of hypocalcemic uh, uh, problems. And um, does she have an appropriate response to low calcium? And yes, her parathyroid hormone is high. So low calcium, high parathyroid hormone, is it dietary, is it something else? And so in fact, um, let's evaluate this a little bit further. Um, looking at bone health uh, markers, alk -phos is alkaline phosphatase is a commonly um, measured thing and comes back sky high. So we also have to then check the 125 dihydroxy. It also comes back quite high. Wow, this is a complex situation. Um, and in fact, actually, um, what we can say is that this is a, a vitamin D dependency rickets uh, type two. And for this, the treatment of choice is um, intravenous calcium and high-dose calcitriol. 
The reason for that is that this is a condition where vitamin D receptor polymorphism, polymorphisms um, exist. And there is a spectrum of uh, vitamin D polymorphisms. Um, and for this type of what be called um, vitamin D dependency rickets type 2, the spectrum exists from kind of complete um, non-responsiveness uh, to calcitriol, activated 125-dihydroxy-D, uh, um, um, to partial response. And so, in fact, actually, treatment actually is to increase levels even further um, than the already elevated levels. And treatment in this uh, case is a two-year-old going to a three-year-old. Um, after 90 days, we're able to normalize her ALKFOS her bone pain is resolved, and her strength is uh, increasing. And actually, her parathyroid hormone is able to be normalized at 120 days. So this, then, is a child whose measurement of the 125-dihydroxy vitamin D led to diagnosis and um, treatment that's within human capacity, and uh, so it has a much more promising um, life ahead of her because of this. All right, last case uh, for our talk today, osteoporosis. Obviously, a huge issue worldwide and increasing with, um, with the aging in the population. So this is a 55-year-old gentleman going to osteoporosis clinic. His DEXA, that is a measurement of bone mineral density, uh, his DEXA score is quite abnormal. His total right hip T score is minus 3.5. The absolute definition of osteoporosis is a T-score of minus 2.5. So he is like way in, into this, and he has multiple fractures, despite bisphosphonate uh, treatment. Now, he also is experiencing fatigue, weakness, weight loss, and falls. He's 55. What's going on? He has history of chronic sinusitis, but otherwise pretty unremarkable. How are we going to make of this? Well, let's think about um, evaluation of bone disease. You know, number one is, you know, it's kind of, does he have normal calcium? Yep. Does he have a normal vitamin D? Yep. And does he normal PTH? Yep. Huh. What else could be going on here? Um, his creatinine normal is normal, so he's got good kidney function. But his ALKFOS is elevated, so something's going on in the bones, we know. And his phosphate, surprisingly, is low. And this is a very interesting uh, condition, a low phosphate. You see this in, uh, like, refeeding disorders and people who have been starved or people who have been alcoholic. Uh, this is a common condition in county hospitals with homeless people coming in. and uh, um, but. You know, this is a 55-year-old active employed uh, man with kind of a, uh, unusual bone history. And so, have to get the 125-dihydroxy to actually understand this case. And in this case, it comes back as low. Wow. How do we make sense of this? And so, this is, um, let me just click to the next slide here. Okay, so this is clearly a hypophosphatemia case, but unusual from what most people experience in their clinical training. So there are three teaching points which are quite reasonable for everyone watching us to know about. And that is, most cases of hypophosphatemia are associated with an increase in 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. And that is because 125-dihydroxy vitamin D is there to increase absorption of phosphate. And so this, um, this is a very unusual picture for them to be separate in any way. Second point is um, that the only explanation for low um, phosphate in the blood and a low 125-dihydroxy vitamin D is due to aberrant production of the FGF23. The other feedback loop um, 
on the 27, the SIP 27B1 and the activation of, um, of vitamin D. And the third teaching point is that excess production of FGF23 is, uh, is due to rare inherited bone conditions not likely to be present in someone at age 55 without prior diagnosis, or occult tumors. And so, in this case, we absolutely have to consider an occult tumor. Um, and so, um, but let's go, and um, because this FGF23 is an important new topic. And so just to know that it's an essential regulator of phosphate homeostasis. Um, language you might see related to it is that there is a receptor 1C and a co-receptor um, in clotho. It inhibits reabsorption of phosphate from the urine, so therefore you'd expect high levels of phosphate to be found uh, in the urine. And there's that negative feedback loop, it decreases production of the 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. So the bottom line is it lowers serum phosphate levels and has to be considered in um, situations of low phosphate in the blood. Okay, so let's kind of uh, take a look. Here is the FGF23. Uh, it has a negative feedback loop to CYP27B1. So therefore, that's where you're gonna have the reductions in the 125 dihydroxy of vitamin D. Um, it also, activates the breakdown enzyme. So you could actually have um, lower 25-hydroxy-D um, going along with this as well. And so um, we're gonna be seeing more of that. And so you think about the nuances of, of, um, of evaluation of bone disease, the 125 and the FGF23 are important ways of kind of expanding um, our capacity to serve uh, patients. So, in this case, of course, we have to start him on phosphate and, um, and have to supplement uh, the uh, calcitriol. Do a scan for the tumor and, it's kind of, and, and sinuses light up. You get a CT, he's got a mass there and uh, go for biopsy, and he's got a, um, a unusual um, a nasal uh, tumor, hemangioperiocytoma-like tumor. Um, and so the treatment choice in this case, again, is surgical and rem with removal. And postoperatively, phosphate and the 125 normalize, pain resolves, he's able to ambulate, and lo and behold, his bones get better. His DEXA score improves with a total T-score going from a very severe uh, level, minus 3.5, to a much more reasonable level of minus 1.7, and that which is more closer with osteopenia. So um, testing in this case um, led to a very nice uh, diagnosis, um, resolution, and um, a marked improvement in quality of life. So as we wrap up here, and we will be taking questions, I will continue on as long as you have time um, and interest, uh, I'll be here. So quick points. Dihydroxy vitamin D is the activated form. It must be considered in hypercalcemic situations, and it should be considered in hypocalcemic situations as well. Um, the differential diagnosis we have to consider in most cases um, are uh, we talk about cancer, we talk about elevated PTH, parathyroid hormone-related protein, excessive supplementation, or excessive 125 production. Um, in outpatient, these are the labs, which are most, uh, the, and the order, the sequence to go, PTH, 25-OH, the related protein, and the 125. Um, Diagnosis of hypercalcemia, hypocalcemia, and we also saw a diagnosis um, of um, unusual bone uh, disease with normal calcemia. Therapeutic use, it's, it can be used for monitoring calcitriol therapy, um, and it can be used for monitoring of calcitriol status with vitamin D supplementation, 
in patients with sarcoid or other granulomatous diseases where they're at high risk for production of the 125-dihydroxy uh, vitamin D. And um, with that, I want to say thank you. And we are now, I'm going to open up for questions and we're going to go to the question and answer um, board here. And um, um, we can also um, do um, uh, laboratory, questions about laboratory tests offline as well, if you want to um, email. Um, and just to say that this, this really, the, the, this um, is the, the purpose of this the webinar is to really talk about the clinical utility of the 125 dihydroxy vitamin uh, D. So we're going to the questions here. Um, 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 going to the first um, question um, is um, is that it comes um, uh, saying that there are many natural isomers of 125. Uh, dihydroxy vitamin D, such as 24-25 and 23-25, which, uh, as you saw, are breakdown products. In some cases, the 24-25 concentration is higher than the 125 concentration. How does it impact diagnosis, and is the determination of these isomers important? Okay, well, thank you for this question. Let me go back and um, and look at, uh, I'm going to show you a, a slide um, here, just a second. Um, okay, so um, here is where we're talking about um, the uh, different isomers. Um, you've got the 1, 23, 25, the 1, 24, 25. You've got um, 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 we put white, um, we've got um, a variety of things, which um, all of which can be measured, and all of which, if your goal is to understand the 125, that's why um, as you've identified a very important technical issue in um, in measurement, and that's why it's kind of so much effort has gone into find something uh, with accurate measurement. Uh, uh, that uh, presumably is a thousand times less concentrated than the 25-hydroxy vitamin D. But you can see that there are multiple isomers that you don't want to be measuring. And, uh, and so that's um, why um, I want to take a look at, at what your laboratory tests can do. Question also you raised um, was how does that impact diagnosis and determination of these important? Um, my sense is that Clinically speaking, um, measurement of these um, uh, plays no significant uh, role in current clinical practice. Um, you do not want to be measuring these accidentally and getting false numbers for your 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. Um, okay, next question. And it comes from the University of Washington. Um, I mean, the question is, um, it, it's, um, I'm trying to uh, translate uh, the English here, is um, the thought of taking vitamin D supplementation with calcium will enhance the effect of vitamin D. Um, and actually, vitamin D, uh, the causality issue here is that vitamin D is related to calcium absorption um, from um, oral sources. And to recognize that, uh, as demonstrated um, 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 I'm having a senior moment, uh, the, uh, our researcher friend at University of Nebraska, um, demonstrated that going from a serum level of 20 nanograms per ml to 30 nanograms per ml increases calcium absorption by 65%. Um, and calcium isn't going to necessarily play a huge role um, in other effects of vitamin D as the 125 dihydroxy vitamin uh, D. Um, but obviously the two of them work together and magnesium and multiple other factors play a role. And, uh, and, um, but the binder to the vitamin D receptor through which all actions are mediated um, is the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. 
and that is under very tight regulation, including uh, calcium um, levels, and so uh, that's uh, how they all intersect. Third question here uh, from the University of Toronto. Most labs measure the um, 25 hydroxy vitamin D using an immunoassay, which measures both D2 and D3 in equal amounts. Are there situations where you would need to differentiate dietary versus endogenous derived forms, such as to monitor prescription supplements? Should pres clinicians be aware of which methods are used in the lab? Okay, so this is. Uh, uh, this takes us out of the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D and into the 25 hydroxy vitamin D measurement. Um, and um, clinically, what counts um, is the measurement of total 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Um, that accounts for and um, and that would be um, going along with vitamin D3. Um, in a extremely small percent of cases, you know, less than 1% of cases, would one ever, you know, consider there being any value to a measurement of vitamin D2? Um, and, because, and so, um, in my experience, what counts is total 25 hydroxy vitamin D and and the idea of getting D2 and D3 measurements is nothing more than clutter um, to to um, complicate people's lives. Um, you measure response and uh, absorption through improvement in these um, in the 25 hydroxy vitamin D measurement. And if you are not if you do not have a good response to an appropriate dosing or what you think appropriate dosing, you have to think of, is it the right dose? Is it being absorbed? What's the differential diagnosis for um, uh, fat-soluble nutrient malabsorption? Do you need to get a vitamin A level as well? Um, can, um, um, uh, do you have um, changes in gut wall integrity affect absorption? Do you have changes in pancreatic digestive enzyme production and the like? The differential diagnosis is, is long. But clinically, the, what counts is total 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Uh, next question, um, also from University of Toronto. The C3 epimer in neonates can interfere with some methods to measure vitamin D. Is there a clinical utility for the C3 epimer in neonates? And um, I'm sorry, I do not uh, know enough to be able to answer that um, question. What I do know is that, um, is that there is a difference between the use of the FDA-approved um, CLIA uh, diagnostic uh, instrumentation for testing for uh, total vitamin D and use of HPLC uh, double mass spec. As uh, documented uh, by Bruce Hollis and others in the medical literature, um, that uh, there are three problems with the HPLC uh, double mass spec. Number one is technically it's, it's extremely difficult, and we saw one national lab testing company have to uh, recall tens of thousands of uh, testings and because of, of uh, violations in, in standard testing procedures and having wildly inaccurate uh, values being reported to clinicians. Um, Second is the HPLC uh, double mass spec also captures many, many, many forms of, of vitamin D um, outside of the ones that are biologically active as currently understood. Um, and so therefore using um, radioimmunoassay or CLIA, um, other uh, advanced immunoassays that don't require radioactivity um, are um, yeah, much more helpful. Perhaps the C3 epimer plays a, a role um, in things, I'm, but I can't answer that uh, more directly. I apologize. Um, um, uh, next question. Does the type of supplementation matter? For example, gummy bears, tablets, oil tablets, are they different in efficacy of the supplementation? 
And what are your thoughts on cod liver oil supplementation? So thank you for this question. This is um, obviously clinically very important in, in guiding uh, patients. Um, so number one is that, um, you know, vitamin D is vitamin D is vitamin D. Um, however, the different products vary significantly by um, what um, um, excipients they are combined with and what forms they, they come in. So um, what has me concerned is, uh, is kind of, are people reactive to other ingredients in it? For example, um, corn is found in a lot of products, um, and um, we can you know, document that a number of people have adverse food reactivity to corn-related products. Um, second, obviously people are aware of gluten and gluten sensitivity issues, um, and they exist in some products. Um, uh, third, um, use of titanium dioxide and other things can also precipitate reactivity in people. Um, and fourth, I'm using things like um, drops, uh, D-drops, for example, um, uh, are based in a coconut oil um, uh, uh, base, and so uh, people can, some people can be reactive to uh, coconut. What counts in, in terms of absorption is really based on digestion uh, and uptake issues. And digestion can vary depending upon whether there's uh, achlorhydria or functional achlorhydria with use of, of um, proton pump inhibitors or other acid uh, blocking medications. Um, there can be disruptions in gut wall integrity and affect um, absorption. Um, there can be um, uh, production difficulties or physical blockage of issues uh, related uh, uh, to pancreatic uh, digestive enzyme uh, production or release, as well as bile production or release, can all play uh, roles in this. Um, and so, uh, big thing is um, you just monitoring how is this person responding? They appear to be responding appropriately or inappropriately. If they are not getting a good clinical response, is it due to um, underdosing for BMI or is it malabsorption issue or adverse food reactivity issue? Cod liver oil, um, of course, is where, quote, the anti-rachitic um, component was found and for treatment of, of rickets. And um, very interesting history. Um, from cod liver oil, people were looking at, was the vitamin A responsible for treating rickets? And they said no. And they found this anti-rickitic uh, factor. And because vitamin B and vitamin C were already taken, it was called vitamin D. And that's where we get our vitamin D um, issue from. So vitamin D is present in cod liver oil. However, the reason I don't recommend cod liver oil uh, for people in general is because it actually has high levels of vitamin A. Uh, pre and I would much rather have people take pre-vitamin A that's found in the carotenoids, um, of which there are over 600 types uh, found in colored vegetables and the like. And then by giving pre-vitamin A, it allows the body to decide on its own how much vitamin A to produce. There, it's probably hard to get vitamin A toxicity from cod liver oil, but given the relationship that has been published in peer literature, um, about uh, vitamin A um, being associated with actually um, kind of an anti-bone um, mineral density uh, effect. Um, I would much rather see people do fish uh, oil or other uh, products um, to get long chain omega-3 fatty acids if they do not have them in their diet um, and to consider um, other sources um, for, um, uh, for um, both vitamin D and vitamin A. And our, our, our um, last question, do you see these same type from Marshall University School of Medicine, uh, thank you. Do you see these same types of trends in the pediatric population? And in the pediatric population, um, there are three areas I think it is really important to be aware of. Number one is that the worldwide um, incidence of vitamin D deficiency in women of childbearing age is incredibly high. Second uh, issue is that vitamin D deficiency during pregnancy has significant ad is associated 
um, with significant adverse impacts on both maternal and fetal health and neonatal health. And um, third um, issue about this is that uh, it appears that prenatal vitamins um, do not provide nearly enough uh, vitamin D for, uh, to reach um, the desired levels for 97.5% of the North American population. Um, this is a, this um, comes from our uh, data um, at the Alina Health um, uh, study I led, uh, where we measured vitamin D levels in 13,500 um, health system employees um, in two sequential years and correlate those with their reported vitamin D intake. And I can tell you that, um, that um, vitamin D status um, needs to be measured because you cannot guarantee a reasonable vitamin D level in, um, in women of childbearing age by taking a prenatal vitamin or a multivitamin. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, issues in pediatric population we need to be aware of is, um, is that one can have a vitamin D deficiency in the neonatal period, um, and that can be related to idiopathic hypocalcemia, um, is kind of hyp which can be related to seizure um, issues, as well as a dilated cardiomyopathy. The response to that is vitamin D and calcium. Um, second thing is, is that in a study I um, uh, led in the city of Monterey, Mexico, where we piggybacked um, uh, vitamin D uh, testing on top of a, a study looking at uh, iron deficiency and anemia in children, of, um, in grade school children, we found a huge incidence of low vitamin D, profoundly low vitamin D in many uh, children. And so how could this be existing in Mexico, a sunny country? The thing is that kids are, more and more kids around the world are tied to the computers or to other things that they're you know, doing through it hands. Um, parents might want kids inside for safety reasons. They might be wearing sunblock. Um, and so they might not be getting nearly enough uh, sun exposure for vitamin D production. Additionally, in the worldwide growth of, um, in incidence of obesity um, is, uh, is, has to be noted as well. The larger the BMI, the more um, sun exposure one needs to reach um, adequate vitamin D levels. Um, the um, way of thinking about that is in a fat-soluble uh, uh, nutrient, you have to look at the volume of distribution. So the larger the tank, the more you need to fill to get to the same level. And so BMI greater than 30 is a significant risk factor for low vitamin D. Um, and um, we're seeing in multiple uh, things in sports with um, you know, stress fractures uh, and like, um, vitamin D is playing a, a significant issue, and so we, in a pediatric population, we cannot presume that children have normal vitamin D levels. Um, that's why I uh, strongly believe in measurement uh, of these, and certainly any child who has uh, requirements for any kind of prescription drug, um, um, uh, certainly I, I believe, and this I'm speaking from opinion and bias, but uh, deserves a vitamin D uh, level and, uh, and monitoring because um, dose does not count. The only thing that matters is the vitamin D level achieved, and that um, it, we can only understand um, by doing an actual measurement. It's like no different than measuring a cholesterol. We can't look at someone with a cholesterol level or or looking at TSH, or um, you just can't really know. And so and that's why also why monitoring is important, just like we monitor warfarin and with the INR or digoxin levels or cyclosporin levels. You know, dosing varies uh, person to person. One size does not fit all. We've got the technology. It's rational uh, use uh, is uh, for monitoring to ensure um, neither overdosing nor underdosing. And I see that we, that is the last of the questions. Um, if you have additional questions, uh, feel free to um, uh, contact the organizers of, of this webinar. I appreciate your time and attention. I hope I've been helpful and provocative, and I hope you understand 
when to get a 25 OH and when to get a 125 dihydroxy uh, vitamin D uh, level. Uh, thank you all very much and have a good day.